Kia koutou katoa, everyone. Welcome um, to Laser Virtual Auckland Chapter presentation of Immersive Experiences, Time, Place and Identity. I'm going to introduce you to our presenters today, Mary Sheehan, Marie Sheehan, Barbara Bollard and Gregory Bennett, who are going to be um, talking about their art science research projects. Um, you will have all read their bios, so I'm not going to go through them. I'd rather let them talk about their work. Um, so without further ado, um, we'll get on with it, but just a little bit of housekeeping to start with. Um, throughout the presentation, you can ask questions in the Q&A section, and there'll be time at the end also for you to ask questions of our presenters today. Also, if you could just put them in the Q&A session, then I can um, relay them to our, our presenters. Um, you obviously uh, are in the chat room, and so I can see you, the attendees, and I can also see the questions as they pop up. Um, they may pop up throughout the presentation. That's always quite helpful. So the first presentation we're going to hear today is um, from Marie, who's going to be, her presentation's audio portraiture, the sound of identity created through immersive and binaural audio environments. So I'm going to, without further ado, hand over the um, conch to Marie and uh, away you go. Kia ora, kia ora Andrew, kia ora everybody. Um, I'm Marie. I'm just going to go onto my PowerPoint and share that with you first. Um, so bear with me for a second while I do that and then I will begin. I hope everybody can see that. Can everyone see that, Andrew? We can, but uh, yeah, there we are, full screen, perfect. Wonderful, okay. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, and thank you for the invitation to share my project research and artistry with you all today. My name is Marie Sheehan, and considering um, I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand, I'm of Māori, Irish, and Scottish ancestry, and my tribal affiliations are Ngāti Maniapoto, Waikato, Ngāti Tūwharitoa, and Ngāti Pākehā. I've been a lecturer at Auckland University of Technology for several years and a musician and sound designer for a lot longer. I recently graduated with my PhD this year, um, which looked at the sound of identity, interpreting the multidimensionality of wahine Māori, Māori women, through audio portraiture. And so today's presentation looks at how does the utilization of immersive and binaural technologies provide a sonically rich audio environment to express their identity. <laughs> Firstly, I mean, what is audio portraiture to start with? The term audio portraiture describes a discrete, immersively experienced audio rendering of an individual's identity. In the design of the portrait, immersive sound technology is used to record synthesize and spatially position interpretations of the person's perspectives, experience and nature. An audio portrait is thus an exploration of an artistic synthesis of sound that seeks to provide insight into a person. In particular, it is concerned with the essence of the person, um, the person being studied, the ways that she is inside in her mind, emotionally and spiritually. A focus of this project is the affirmation and honouring of Māori women's voices. And these audio portraits contribute to artistic interpretations grounded from Māori ways of knowing. Portraiture of Māori women has remained largely confined to the concerns with pictorial imagery and as such has failed to draw into consideration the potentials of a rich spectrum of purely oral modes that are integral to Māori ways of knowing and being. This project explores how audio portraiture might provide a way of reconceptualizing biographical material within a Māori epistemological framework by integrating the physically accountable. So things like music, history, opinion, dialogue, knowledge and identity, and also the esoteric, wairua meaning spirit, and Māori, the life force. The rationale for this project is the need to address a dominant colonial constructed and under questioned mode of representing Māori women. The contribution into the expansion of the concept of, of portraiture as an oral medium considered how immersive and binaural technologies could provide a sonically rich audio environment to express their identities. And after researching both immersive and binaural sound practices 
It highlighted this field of auditory spatial perception and ability to hear multiple simultaneous sound sources in a three-dimensional localized space is a complex human phenomena determined by numerous physiological and cognitive processes. The use of binaural recording technologies and the reproduction of binaural audio content over headphones has the potential to mimic and enhance the natural reproduction of a particular human localization, meaning that the ways in which humans actually hear. The project also demonstrates how binaural immersive technologies are employed to capture an audio impression and representation of a localized environment and artistically compose such data into a text that communicates an interpretation of identity. It also suggests that the immersive nature of sound has the potential to activate sensory responses for a listener that reach beyond the parameters of visual. This is because 360 immersive and binaural sound capture technologies can be orchestrated into artistic works that convey unique experiences of space and time. Such work may be designed as a distinctive form of portraiture. Two significant sound technological factors in creating and developing audio portraiture is the gathering of audio data from various directional, binaural, and ambio immersive sonic sources. This was achieved by considering a variety of recording devices for capturing atmospheric and interview material. These included directional microphones, lapel mics, binaural and 3D ambio microphones with an F8 zoom field recorder out in the field. Um, the binaural dummy head, which you can see on the left and the right hand side, um, is the KU100. And I use this to capture audio, having historically explored how binaural sound capture might help us to understand human perception of sound. It was also significant in the fact that I wanted listeners to listen to the audio portraits over headphones. The use of artificial dummy head that has two microphones placed on the left and the right ears enabled a simulation of how human beings hear. The ambiosonic sound capture was also an important technological application because it enabled me to record environmental ambient spaces relative to the participants' personal, cultural and social settings. And these recordings contributed to the creation of immersive experience in the audio portraitures because the technology provided a means to recording 360 sound spheres of both interior and exterior environments relative to each Māori woman. The reproduction of these 360 ambio sound recordings created a spherical spatial depth whereby a listener is able to feel immersed and embodied in the same location as the material was recorded. Ambiosonic sound capture also enabled me to increase sonic texture and emphasize the unique experience of space and time. When it came to the sound design and 3D sound mixing, I utilized Logic Pro X for audio sketching, audio drafting, and experimentation. Pro Tools HD Ultimate and Spatial Audio Facebook 360 provided me with the ability to create dynamic and immersive spatial audio mixes because it supports ambiosonics and binaural recordings. This has afforded me flexibility when working with immersive audio. It also allows me to import ambiosonic audio sources and then to pan, edit, and mix these audio materials. Importantly, Facebook 360 with Pro Tools HD enabled the rendering of ambiosonic audio formats into stereo down mix that is playable over headphones. And so what I want to do is to give you um, a snippet of each of the audio portraits. Uh, before I do, I'd, um, I would encourage you to please put your headphones on because that's really the way that we, um, that the audio portraits have been um, sonically designed. They're designed to be heard over headphones, which give you, which really gives you that um, immersive feeling and that feeling of being embodied with the with the Māori woman. Uh, the first one that I have is um, Tarita Pappage and I'm just going to quickly give you a little bit of a, a bio about her before I play the snippet. 
Um, Tarita, Dr. Tarita Pepper, is Ngati Apakura, Waikato Maniapoto Ngati Parau, and Ngati Fakawe. Tarita is well recognized for her long involvement in Kapahaka, which is Māori performing arts. With over 40 years of experience, she is considered a consummate exponent of this art form. Alongside Kapahaka and her whānau, education has been a huge part of Tarita's life. She graduated with her doctorate from Canterbury University in 2015 with a PhD titled Creating a Modern Māori Identity through Kapahaka. She currently lectures in the Masters of Applied Indigenous Knowledge degree at Te Wānanga o Aotearoa. So I'm just going to play this snippet for you and, um, and tell you where later where you can listen to the whole portrait if you have time. So this is Tarita. I am every day inspired by a lot of people, but it's my own children and my mukupuna now that are growing up. So yeah, I have to say, I can't be solitary. I can't be selfish. I have to give my time and energy and love and spirit and everything to my children and grandchildren. I can't deny myself. So that's a small part of it, and and each portrait that I did is is round between uh, six to seven minutes each. And um, at the end of my presentation, I will show you the uh, website where or the web experience where you can listen to all three of the portraits um, in full. The next person, oops, sorry, is um, a very well known. Māori singer, songwriter, and activist. Her name is Moana Maniapoto, and she is Ngāti Tūwhare Toa, Tūhaurangi, and Ngāti Pikiao. And Moana Maniapoto has become regarded as one of the most significant voices in Aotearoa music scene. She is a political activist who continues to write and produce contemporary Māori music that legitimises and brings Māori language and culture into the mainstream. Now, I'm not going to go too much into her biographical material because that all can be read um, on the web experience that I will show you at the end of this presentation. And so this is a snippet from her audio portrait. <laughs> you know, when you're Māori, you, you're a walking, breathing political statement. Well, I was always coped up with that was my life. When you don't see yourself on television, you don't see yourself on the radio, it's easy to get the impression that your culture doesn't doesn't count. So it's been 30 years now. Stuff all has changed. And the third oh, sorry, and the third portrait that I have is Whakawakine, Wahine Māori, Ramon Tewake, she's from Ngāpuhi, Ngāti Whātua and Te Rarawa. Ramon Tewake is a New Zealand Whakawakine, which translates into Māori transgender woman. Um, she's a documentary maker, singer-songwriter and television presenter. And she considers herself a trans activist. And this is a snippet from her audio portrait as well. It's been an interesting journey, I think, for me. You know, the woman before me, the trans woman before me. I love it. Um, who paved the way, who worked the streets, who were brutalised by police and corruption and all that kind of stuff. And I have different stories. And I'm taking to stare you in the eye. Why do you hate people like us? Well, I'm going to come and look at each and every one of you. I don't mind at all. Your hatred is totally um, intolerable. You should be beautifully bold. And I think that to be part of the global conversation, which is, you know, standing up and being accounted and sharing your voice. It's 
Um, so this project and research and artistry culminated in an exhibition at the Auckland Arts Festival this year in March 2020, which was titled Otairongo. And um, in conclusion, I employ new and emerging technologies in my work to explore the identity of, of, of sound and, and the way that sound um, explores identity in this project and the power and the complexity of um, ambio and binaural and sound um, to, to enable to, to produce um, a representation of these women's identities um, is, an, is an important project. Um, I see the development of Māori portraiture as conversant with the response to the potentials of such sound technologies because I see new media in a continuum of, in, of opportunities that arise and should be considered by each generation of contemporary artists. I see my work as, com as composed sound that might be positioned within a broader conception of sound art. Thus, I see myself as a sound designer, audio culturalist and sound practitioner. Like well-known sound designer David Toop, uh, these audio portraits constitute creative audio expressions of material found in the natural world integrated into sound designs in physical and non-physical ecologies. And here my audio portraits function as a social creation existing inside a complex social, cultural and political network. Um, the project and research um, of Otairongo, like I said, was exhibited at Auckland Arts Space um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand and Auckland. And it, is, um, it was the first uh, immersive installation of its kind in the world and has now been asked to be um, on loan and commissioned by the Auckland Arts Gallery for the inaugural Toi Tu Māori Contemporary Arts Exhibition this year in November 2020. So I'm going to uh, leave that, stop sharing, and um, tēnā koutou katoa. Into your audio. Thank you. Bit of an image mistake there. Sorry, Kia ora, Marie. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I just I posted the website on the in the chat room for people that they can just cut and paste it for then. Uh, Wonderful. I found it really interesting. Thank you. Um, I did. Uh, um, yeah, so it's great for people to go along and have a listen to all, the whole work. I, I can tell you, we'll get into the Q and A at the end, but I can tell you, having experienced your work. Um, it's really emotional, it's evocative, it's effective. Um, and it, it, when I, <laughs> what always strikes me when I think about it is I always think I can see the people who are talking because the power of the voice is so intense. It's almost like the imagination is sparked. So that's the power of the work. So I urge people to go and have a, one of the powers What's of the work. Yeah, it's the point. It's the point, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's the power of sound. It's the power of massive and binaural sound yeah, yeah. to, like, like, like you say, feel um, when you listen to it, really feel like you are embodied with that person. And often, when you really take the time to listen uh, mindfully, you feel as if you are really with each woman. You know, you're yeah. like, right. I do. I feel like I'm right beside them. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it, I have got a lot of that kind of um, response to the work, which is great, really good. I will talk more in depth at the end, but they are very powerful human beings, each and every one of them, women, just are. strong characters, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. It's just really hard to, to, to kind of um, get into each and every one, in, you know, in a short amount of time, but um the web experience, the Otairongo web experience is there that, that gives you the three of the audio portraits in their full state, as well as biographies around each, each wahine as well. So um, I would suggest to take, if you can take the time to, to be Absolutely. immersed. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Marie. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I just, uh, just another little bit of housekeeping. I realised that, um, the, the attendees might not know that their microphones are turned off as a default um, 
as part of the way the webinar is set up. So you can't actually speak to, or we can't hear you within this experience, but you can certainly send us chats and ask questions in the chat room. Okay, so we're now going to um, move into the next presentation, which is Gregory Bennett and Barbara Bard. Hi, uh, Greg and um, Barbara, you're uh, going to be talking today about the Sir Edmund Hillary's Antarctic Heart, Antarctic Hut virtual reality experience. So I'm going to hand over to you now and I'm going to um, see you at the end. Thank you. Hi, Thank everyone. You. <laughs> We're just going to flip into our, um, into our PowerPoint as well. Things off. Mm -hmm. I'll start the presentation. Um, yep, this is a very collaborative group that we work with. It's a combination of science, computer science, engineering, art, and design, and with our partners in VR and Antarctic Heritage. We're gonna talk about an experience and Greg will dive more into the experience. It's really an experience for the general public to be able to tour a very important scientific and heritage location via virtual reality. And we drove this project and worked on it together and it allowed us to blend our art and science background. I led a group of researchers. My interest and background is in conservation and protected area management. I have a strong history of geospatial sciences and remote sensing, and I use drones and other technology to map habitats, to map landscapes, and now historic locations, mainly for conservation planning. This is us at work in Antarctica. And uh, my background is very much in, uh, in digital art and design. Um, so my background is uh, technically working in 3D animation, visual effects, motion capture, projection mapping, uh, interactive media, and now uh, virtual reality more recently um, as well. So uh, as, as we'll, we'll talk a bit about, it's been very much a, a kind of a, a collaborative experience across our different disciplines. I'm first gonna talk a bit about how we collected the data. And it's the data that connected both Gregory and myself and brought us together to create this work of art based on a real world location. So I led the team that went into Antarctica in the field campaign. And this just gives you an example of the landscape that we worked in. This area here is Scott Base. It is the New Zealand Antarctic base. Um, it's in green. There was one orange building and that is the hut that we focused on because that was Sir Edmund Hillary's hut or the Trans-Antarctic Expedition Hut. Um, and this gives you an idea. I just want you to look out over the buildings to the landscape where we work. It is very, very remote and very, very barren. There's some real challenges to working in Antarctica that we've had to face over several seasons. And some of these challenges include things like the fact that it's 24 hours of daylight in the summer and 24 hours of darkness in the winter. Um, we are extremely limited by weather. We're extremely limited by logistics. You know, it's expensive to get us down there. The New Zealand program, we fly down, but it takes a lot of planning and a lot of preparation. So we are limited by all these things, weather, logistics, costs, and the time of year. We do scientific work in Antarctica. So that means we have to take sensors or cameras or all sorts of equipment down that has to be able to withstand extreme conditions. The warmest day we had is at this place here, you can see on the image, and that's what we call Botany Bay. That was our, you know, Club Med. It was minus one degree, and that's a warm sunny day. Um, but, you know, we had to deal with extreme temperatures such as minus 30 degrees Celsius or minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we had technical sensors. Um, they are required for the precision um, flight lines that we do for the drone surveys. I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. And one of the issues with using drones in Antarctica is that you're so far south that the magnetic compasses just don't work properly at those high latitudes. Everything is north from where we work. 
And this is an example of one of the drones that we take with multiple sensors embedded on it. We customize the drones for these cold climates. We warm the batteries and do all sorts of things. This was an actual balmy day. It's 3 a.m. when this photo was taken. So that gives you an idea of the 24 hours of daylight. We can't just take an off-the-shelf drone. These are custom-built drones that are built in-house by our engineer, Ashray Doshi. Um, this is us in the field flying. Uh, it gives you an idea of how isolated we really are. There is no one around us, and these are really amazing experiences. When this photo was taken, we actually heard these strange sounds. I was thinking of Marie's talk, and the sounds were actually penguins chitter-chattering, probably wondering what in the world that drone was. They were on the ice shelf down below. What do we collect? We collect a lot of images, thousands and thousands of images, which we stitch together to create 3D landscapes. This is the 3D model of Scott Base, which I showed you from above. Um, this is the model looking back at it. You can see the building in orange, which is the hut that we're going to talk to you about with the virtual reality experience. Just to give you an idea of resolution, this is what we call a point cloud. And the point cloud is the data structure that both Gregory and I connected on, that we both have in common. Um, an example, just clicking on one point or one spot on that map shows you the level of resolution. You can see tire tracks from the skidoos, but you can also see the lovely face of the Maori carving that is found at Scott Base at the entrance. We work in partnership on this project with the Antarctic Heritage Trust in New Zealand, and they are responsible for restoring the historic huts that were that are down in Antarctica and that are under New Zealand jurisdiction. Um, the example we're going to show you is the fully restored Trans-Antarctic Expedition Hut, or it's commonly referred to as the Sir Edmund Hillary Hut, because he worked there as well. So my team not only did the exterior and modeled the landscape around the hut, but we also did the LIDAR scanning within the hut. So we used a LIDAR scan um, and we put out registration spheres and grids all around the rooms. Uh, we scanned each room and they were later combined and Gregory is going to talk about the process of combining that in the post-processing. This just shows you an example of the LIDAR scanner in action. At the higher level, we've also did scans lower down as well, and with the photo, the reference spheres around the place. Um, before we even went to Antarctica, we sat with Gregory, we discussed the processes that we needed, we discussed the rooms, we also sat with the Antarctic Heritage Trust, and we mapped out the entire area and mapped out where we were going to put our spheres and where we were going to do the scans. So when we got there, um, we knew what we were doing. One thing about Antarctica is it's kind of this hurry up and wait. Um, you get a very limited time in the field and you have to get everything achieved. It's a very, very um, time constrained experience. So you need to be very well prepared. Again, this is just showing you the scanner working in some of the different rooms. And that is the entrance way where we had the reference fall and the sheets. Greg's going to take over for now. Thanks very much, Barbara. So just to just to reiterate too, again, um, part of our points of connection was um, that we had this kind of common language around 3D data when we had initially kind of started talking. So that was something, you know, I, I deal in 3D data with in terms of 3D animation, um, visual effects, um, uh, computer graphics, et cetera as well. So that was a that was a kind of immediate shared language that we were able to kind of build on. So as well as the um, LiDAR scanning, which uh, uh, again uh, gives us this, the, these data sets, um, photogrammetry was also undertaken under there, which is, uh, gives us these sort of detailed, I mean, hundreds of photographs taken all around the interiors here, which gives us extra information that we can incorporate with the LiDAR scanning, which is very important for, for capturing, um, again, the essence of all these surfaces and, and interior details. So just wanting to signal some of the technical aesthetic challenges. Part of the challenge for my post-production team, which involved our digital designers, was to be able to shrink these very large source data sets into, uh, and to operate within a game engine, which is what you need to run a, a virtual reality experience. And we also needed, uh, at the same time, to maintain a kind of photorealistic detail here, 
this is for a general audience who want to give them the sense of an authentic um, experience um, within, you know, visiting this virtually, that this is um, this uh, site, which they normally would never have the opportunity to do that. So, so that was part of the, sort of the, the challenge here. Also sort of aesthetically, you know, what this creates, this data is capturing this kind of complex 3D um, snapshot. So there's a strong sense when you're actually exploring it, even if it's in its rough form, this um, strong indexical relationship to the site itself, the sense of presence that you feel. Um, and um, and I, what I sort of term as signifiers or, or, or authenticity are kind of embedded in the aesthetics of this data, which is um, kind of an, an interesting aspect to it with, in terms of immersive experiences. So this is very much, again, a snapshot of 19, of a restored version from, from the late 1950s um, that, that you're able to see here. I can't play video on Zoom, so this gives you just a, I just wanted to sort of do a, uh, run a few frames here. This is what the um, LiDAR data kind of looked like uh, to me, so again, there's millions of uh, 3D points in space, each with a, a color um, value associated with each of these points, so very large um, data files. Um, the LiDAR had some, um, uh, there were some issues with LiDAR, it can't, it uh, has problems with uh, highly reflective surfaces, so there's a lot of stainless steel areas, which is something that we had to look at rebuilding in our post-production process. Um, and then the next process is really taking this and these are examples from our first kind of uh, rough VR experience where we were able to sort of walk around and look and see what the data was. So it was fantastic to see the level of kind of photographic detail in 3D, which you can, which again, invites you to explore it. Um, uh, again, there's this very strong sense of kind of, um, of presence and authenticity in, that's embedded in, in the uh, data itself. Of course, uh, it's not perfect. You can see jagged edges. There's, there's some issues with uh, some of the models etc but this even this first run it was a very kind of compelling experience and um, we did show it to people who'd been there and they definitely um, you know again sort of vouched for its feeling of you know of familiarity from from the, the space itself um, but there were there were whole, um, also things like artifacts so being able to get up close and actually see in detail that these these historic um, kind of details and artifacts was, was, was great for younger viewers that were seeing, they were fascinated too by technologies of the time, so the, the, the telephone and the, the kitchen um, um, and implements as well, which was very interesting for them. And again, um, the, the, the technology just allows this wonderful fidelity of, of, um, of detail that you can get close up and, and look at in, in the 3D environment. And some of these artifacts, this is an anemometer, um, again, a, a very historic artifact which um, uh, measures wind, and we were able to incorporate this into the um, the interactive experience is something that, that, the, um, that you, the user can actually use. So um, just sort of returning to this idea of the, these signifiers of authenticity, that the baked in lighting and shadow was incredibly uh, useful for us as, as, as uh, virtual reality makers. Um, it, it, it's uh, something that we didn't have to simulate uh, inside the game engine and, um, and, and also the sort of details of textures and lighting, the old Sort of vinyl surfaces, etc., are, are all there um, in the data itself. So, so that was something that, that again was a, a compelling aesthetic um, uh, part of, of the um, a feature of, of, of the uh, experience as well. The um, technical issues we had to deal with was removing artifacts that, 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 that we we don't need, obviously. So that all the registration points, the as I mentioned before, the, the shiny um, surfaces um, were uh, were an issue which we had to we have to picked up by hand so any of these uh, again the the um, uh, again 3D data uh, would not solve very well also because you're doing uh, in some of the rooms three or four different uh, um, captures with the LiDAR you're getting you can see on the floor there these um, multiple exposures laid on top of each other so we, again we had to sort of clean up those those textures um, uh, by hand and um, this is uh, on the left hand side, the original, this is what we kind of had solved the 3D data to. So it's very complex. We need to again shrink that down. So a lot of this had to be on the right hand side, sort of cleaned up by hand, creating new um, 3D geometry over the top of the old stuff, but preserving the, the, um, the added value where you had a lot of detail and, and, and artifacts. And then working through room by room, um, very in a very, very detailed way, um, just cleaning up all of the photographic texture detail using the photogrammetry, etc. Um, so preserving what we needed to and cleaning up where there were holes in the data. And this um, here is just sort of uh, looking at sort of uh, before and after again um, the cleanup process. So we end up with this um, again. It's a sort of a tribute to the sort of artistry of the 
um, the, the, uh, the team who worked on this, um, but also wanting to make sure we, we preserve the, um, you know, as much as possible, the photorealistic look of the original um, as well. Um, and these are, and this is um, just some before and afters of the, from the, um, the first run, and then what the, um, some screenshots through the VR of, of the sort of final experience. Um, and you can see there that we get, again, preserving that wonderful detail, um, and, uh, but also that it's nice and sort of cleaned up as well, that it that, that it's, um, will be an acceptably photo real look for our audience, our sort of target audience. Um, um, and again, all of these, uh, allowing, again, the exploration of all of these um, sort of artifacts as well. So this is a, a project that's uh, freely available. It's on Steam. It is also a phone app version of it as well. So part of the, the sort of um, uh, the the aims of this project was to make this um, make this experience accessible to as many people uh, as possible, um, and to kind of uh, again, it's part of an inspiring narrative too around you know, exploration, science, um, and, and and history and heritage um, as well. Um, so yeah. So that's, uh, uh, <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that, that's, that, that's our sort of uh, presentation. We encourage yes, you to go to the website, yes, the website and, yeah. and download it and yep. interact yeah, with it. <laughs> yeah, and as I said, if you've got a VR set and you, you can download it from Steam, but also there's a very accessible phone app version from, from uh, Google or the App Store for that as well. Thank you. So thanks, that's everyone. Great. Got Thank you both. Thank you both. That was really interesting. Um, we've got uh, several questions coming in already, so um, <laughs> that's great. Oh, I guess we stopped uh, sharing. That's great. Um, so um, I'll just read some of the questions out um, as they come in. Marie, you already answered one from Shelley. So do you want to start? Do you want? Shall I read out the question? Maybe you could just um, answer so everyone sure. can can hear you talk to that. So Shelley said, "Kia ora, Marie. Thank you for presenting such this awesome work." Can you talk about the beautiful imagery that accompanies the work on the website? Sure. Um, kia ora, Shelley. Thank you for your question. Yeah. So um, there are a couple of there are a couple of visual aspects um, that that accompany or total more the exhibition, and, and one was the graphic material that went with the promotion of of the exhibition and. I worked with a Māori artist called Tyrone Ohia, who's amazing at um, being able to conceptualise lots of different artistry and designs. Um, and what we were looking at is how how do we design something that is not not visual, um, and then also how do we look at making something that uh, that kind of represents sound. Um, frequency, the frequency of sound, um, but also the essence of Māori and of um, Māori women. So Tyrone did a bit of, um, did some sketches that I really, really liked. And what we did with those sketches is to, we ended up going with a, with a really amazing photographer and we had my niece dress up in a, in a black suit who had an LED panel made of a light LED light panel. And what we did in the dark was switched on that panel and she um, moved, the, moved the light um, like you would with a poi. And basically the shutter speed was set so low that it captured this, the movement of, uh, of the lights. And that's what those images are. They are, they are images of, of her movement, but they're also um, to me, look like the frequency of sound. Uh, so that's that's yeah, that was Tyrone's um, Tyrone's ideas and yeah, beautiful work that he came up with. So that's the first visual aspect, and the second visual aspect would be the actual pods and cocoons that when you physically go to the exhibition, you sit in these, um, you're surrounded by these pods when you put earphones on and. And the pods are um, a representation of the case moth, which is um, um, connected to Hinero Katodi, who's uh, the goddess of sound and music. But that's a very long story to get into and not enough time here. But those are probably the two aspects of um, the visual elements of Wotaira War. 
Thank you, Marie. That was a great answer. Um, and of course, you can go to the website and have a look at the work there and hear it, obviously. <laughs> Um, got a question from Danielle um, who says, Kia ora, I love the painterly quality of the rendering. This is to Gregory and Bennett, uh, Gregory Bennett and uh, Barbara. Uh, what would you estimate was the time it took for cleaning up, rendering and optimizing for the VR space? I'm going to quietly laugh in the corner here. I... Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. I mean, this is actually a project that had a two year trajectory. Um, when we started it, we didn't, we weren't even sure what we could actually do. So a lot of this, um, some of the, uh, so the short answer was um, it, it was probably a year process um, and it was also discovering what we needed to do. So um, all of the, the, the cleanup, there was a lot of stuff that had to be done by hand. We had a high standard that we had to um, adhere to. We were using our, our game engine of choices, Unreal Engine, because also at the time it had the, the kind of um, edge in terms of producing, you know, really beautiful looking graphics um, and to be able to run efficiently as well. Um, but we were also able to draw on the um, kind of um, skills and research that some of our postgraduate, well, one particular postgraduate student, Katerina Markovic, had been um, working on in her master's as well, where she had been working with pipelines around optimising for VR. So so, so that, that kind of... Um, uh, and interfacing and, and uh, you know, new, learning new knowledge, I guess, to this project was, was really good. So, yes, it was a it was a uh, a good year of post production, kind of all up, and we all kind of pitched into we had to do a lot of um, remodeling and and text mm -hmm. to clean up. Um, but again, based in keeping the authenticity of um, of uh, you know of the source data was was important too. So there's nothing, it can't be done automatically yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's good yeah. that it can't be done automatically. Yeah. The human thanks, touch thanks is important, I think. So um, you answered Ross's question around whether you use Unity or Unreal. Yeah. Um, not sure if there is um, um, there's uh, any anything else you can add to that, but if there is, there yeah, as, as I said, it was definitely at the time, and and it was you know it, it, we wanted the the aesthetic issues were very important. So and uh, um, something that's something that Unreal has had the edge over in terms uh, in terms of Unity, and um, um, so uh, and and we definitely found that that was it. And I I had also been working on a uh, on a different another project, which is sort of an undersea very complex graphics project, which is set yeah set underwater with a with coral reefs and everything, and I'd already had a bit of experience with, with seeing that. So definitely, if you're wanting the, um, I have definitely found so far, if you want wanting that that sort of photo real aesthetic, that Unreal was, was very useful for that. Great. Um, well, I've got a couple of questions for um, both presentations. So I'll, I'll go back to Marie again <laughs> just for a minute. Um, so given the times we're living in, obviously COVID is on everyone's mind. And I'm just wondering, you were talking about the exhibition before about like it, it was up and it was running. Like what happened to it? Like, can you go into more detail what happened to it when COVID hit? Like what, what did you do? Like what was the, yeah. what was the response you, in more detail? Um, yeah, it, it, completely. It's, it's pretty crazy times um, out there in the world and, um, we had, you know, an art space and, and myself had, and a team of us had, you know, really worked hard to get the exhibition up physically within the gallery and it, um, and kind of giving people the opportunity to, um, to be within the pods, to be in a much more darkened space, to be in a much more immersive, visually immersive, immersive space as well as audially. And so um, when that hit, it was like, all of that work is like, oh, what can we do with this? And luckily, you know, um, audio portraits are audio. So um, we work, I worked with a team called, you know, with Tyrone Orr here and, and his team called Extended Farno. We look at uh, creating a web experience, which is the link that you've put up. Um, and, and, and thinking about that, the experience is really about providing a space where where the web, web experience or the web design is very dark. Um, it uses some of the graphics as well, but it's trying to give people the idea to or invite people an offering to give to people, but invite people to, to um, come to the website, but not to be overly visual because that's not what 
it's all about the sound. And so um, putting the putting the wave forms um, up there, the audio portraits up there, because both physical exhibition and online is delivered through headphones. So that way you can still get a, a very much an immersive and embodied experience um, from the website. But you really need to take the time um, to to do that and not and not be so um, and not be distracted. So that's probably the difference between the web, web experience and going to a gallery is that when you go to a gallery, you kind of have set in your mind that that's what you're going to be doing. Um, so if you do, I encourage you to yeah, take some time out of your day, if you can, and just find a quiet, darkened space and put your headphones on, the best headphones you've got, and, um, and, listen, to, and listen to them when you can. Um, we've got another question uh, from Danielle here, and this is for all of the artists and scientists involved here. Um, what, are you, what are you working on now and uh, what are you planning? Uh, well, can you tell us? Are you allowed to tell us? Are you allowed to tell us or is it? Uh, I, I can say, well, I, I guess one, uh, apart from all that, a lot of things we're working on, um, you know, um, together. together um, <laughs> there's going to be more opportunities for us. And I guess the third partner we must keep acknowledging is the Antarctic Heritage Trust. And there was, um, and our, our colleague there, Francesca Ethorn, was, was amazing. And, um, and we, 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 it was, again, uh, a very much a to and fro collaborative experience. You know, we, 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 it's part of their, their heritage that we're, we're helping preserve and, and to create uh, and to make accessible. So there are other historic huts there which um, we're, we're very excited about, um, and and uh, can, I mean uh, Barbara can speak to her. Um, you know, you 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 you've I'm sure got more journeys planned as well. Yes, we <laughs> yeah. were pre-COVID. We were going down this season to um, develop new virtual reality experiences for two more historic huts. Um, that's been put on hold because the entire season has been put on hold due to COVID. Um, but we are working on some additional data that we collected while we were down there when we collected the data for the Sir Edmund Hillary Hut. And that's a project we're doing together. And what we love doing together is working with students and mm -hmm. engaging students in this process, as well as learning from the historic trust as well. You know, so it's a nice partnership yeah. and we're enjoying that. Yeah. yeah. So that's one big project we're working on now. <laughs> Very good. Marie, what about you? What are you up to? Oh, so, so, so many things. Um, I think it's just, I, I'm still still with um, the Otairongo um, experience and, the, and taking it now to um, Open Art Gallery. So that's probably my first thing. Um, and then um, I'm working, I'm going to be working with Barbara and Gregory. They don't know it yet, but yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, and Andrew. <laughs> Where is the where is the sound for this? You know, where is that's the, where exactly the what we were saying. <laughs> yeah. So um you heard it here first. Um yeah. <laughs> but also, yeah, I, I work I work in um, postgraduate work with students and, and undergraduate as well in sound design and music. And so um looking at you know sharing these these technological advances with them. Um and more portraits to do. I'm just thinking about um, who who I who I'm considering doing next, um, and yeah, it's there's there's lots to do. I mean, there's just yeah, once you. I think like Greg and Barbara and, and Andrew. Once you kind of um, understand the ideas of virtual reality and and, and immersive and embodied experiences. Um, whether it be audio portraits or environments, it just there's so much to do. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Unmute. I'm, I'm turning off the twoies because they can be distracting <laughs> in the background. <laughs> okay, so I've got a question here from Ericsson to all of you as well. So Marie, Gregory and Barbara, um, what steps would you suggest for artists wanting to work towards integrating and collaborating on scientific and environmental projects. Like, how do you find scientists to work with? Oh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> I've wondered the same thing myself. No. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I, I definitely, for me, it's been very serendipitous. It, it, partly, it, it's been conversations. It's been bumping into people. It's been at, at events or conferences or or through colleagues. Um, it, it, you know, it's not something that um, it, it, that's been necessarily, you know, engineered as such. Um, no, not at, at all. I'm afraid to say. I mean, but it's the more you can kind of um, cross paths with people and. Or, or, or reach out um, to you know uh, across those those boundaries of, of, of design art design and science or or um, you know it, 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 the, the better because we do actually have uh, what I find is we do have a shared we do have a lot of shared technical language and and conceptual language actually uh, it's very interesting so yeah so I guess that's my two cents worth there but um, yeah. I, I, I think that, that's what, that's been my experience so far. So there's, there's no one sort of way, but I think I think reaching out, social media is another thing. Seeing what other people are doing, um, yeah. And I think for me, it's also sharing a common vision. Mm-hmm. I know talking to Andrew and Marie and, and Gregory, it's it's really sharing those common values. And that's I very passionately in conservation, and I think. And also in our indigenous culture and in our in our land, and the connections to land. So it's just a natural synergy to work with artists. It made sense, and we connected through that. I think in that shared vision, more so than you know a scientific talk or or, or something like that. We bumped into each other, and as you said, it 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 happens because it's meant to, and and because we share those common values. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I totally agree with both you, Barbara and Gregory. It's, it's really, in some ways, I just I think it's really about the co-papa. It's really about the vision. And, and you got you know, it. Um, it was, it was, you know, like you said, it's for me, it's indigenous knowledges, but it's also about environment. Um, and and so that's I think probably the passion that we both have that we shared. Yeah. It's just it's just that scientists have a different way of. Um, expressing that in artists do and so when we have a same purpose and goal um, that's really what brings us together yeah mm. and that, that dialogue is very important it's so much more so these days and, and I think part of what I'm hoping to part of these synergies is, is allowing things like science knowledge to be communicated further um, you know in, in a more, more popular way possibly as well that that's always you know, com- communication out to communities of, of this of, of these knowledges is really important I think into 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 wider communities. The other thing this, these partnerships have helped me with is it's expanded my ability to do my science. It's provided me with new insights I never knew were possible. And it's fantastic. I feel like that we're on the cusp of something fa- brilliant and exciting. So it's it's a wonderful journey. Thank you. Actually, you've answered a couple of the questions I had around the development oh. of the, co- the common language and like how you work together. Um, but maybe leave that to the end if we've got some um, time because I've got a couple of other questions. Shelley also said that she wanted to know about the sound for the Antarctic project too. So that's good, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> what about the sound? Okay. And then... But it's cold. The- <laughs> well, when, when you were giving your talk, Marie, I said to Greg, oh my goodness, that's next. That's the next yeah, yeah. thing. That's what we're missing. Or, Not just the or, cold, because that's, yeah, you know, yeah. but the sound of the penguins, the sound of the wind whistling through the creaky, you know, boards. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to get smell in there because there's some interesting smells in those old huts <laughs> where they use seal yeah. blubber. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, audio mapping would be, would be amazing. Yeah. 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 We're trip to um, Antarctica but- soon then. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stanley has got a question here. So do you uh, engage with any philosophical, theoretical ideas about cognition and perception, e.g. the embodied mind, 4E cognition, and et cetera, in relationship to VR slash XR? So I'm assuming that's for both. both I think that's you. I yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question apart from um, when I think about the embodied mind, um, sound has the ability to definitely um, trigger psychological um, 
Im imagery, I suppose, in some ways. Um, I think that's the power of sound. So when you listen to the audio portraits without any visual um, stimulation, what happens is that the mind fills those spaces itself. And that's what um, was, was part of the project as well. And part of the, part of the research is, is how to do that. It's like reading a book, you know, words trigger um, triggers imagery where, where our minds make our own stories within our heads that are attached to the sound and so I think that's probably one of the powerful things about sound it, it's, it can do that if that's what you meant Stanley I'm not sure if that's what you meant but. Greg, can you, have you anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it's very interesting because I think we're such a new in a way, it's a medium that's building on older mediums for virtual reality um, cinematic uh, interactive etc but it's also it has its own language that we're still um and ex experiential um, kind of issues that, that we're still discovering um so it's it's interesting looking at, at the literature around it because again that is still developing in terms of people's research around these areas in relationship um you know to, to immersive experiences i think there was when i started there were a lot of do's and don'ts and rules that we were told we couldn't, couldn't do so i think that that's something that we we, we only discover by making and doing at the moment. So I feel I'm in that sort of making and doing process um, and the, the sort of re the reflection and the kind of um, the, the theory w is something that starts to kick in as, as through the doing <laughs> as such. Um, but, um, but I'm very aware of, um, you know, I, I, you know, I'm aware of literature around these things, but it's, it's um, we're at that stage of really in a way formulating our own, you know, pipelines, processes, and also um, reflecting on our uh, measuring, you know, sort of measuring experience, the, the sort of what the experiences are as well. But um, yeah, that might be another, also another researcher to bring in yes. <laughs> to, to help us with, with all of that, that those specialised areas. It's really interesting. Uh, that talk about building on um, thinking from older technologies or other technologies is really interesting to me. So, you know, I, I think we've spoken in the past, Greg, about this, but um, you know, cinema was originally thought of as this, as the, was talked about theoretically as an, as an empathy machine. And as, and, and as VR has sort of emerged, people have started to speak to it as that type of experience as well, right? So, and, and, and when you get into something that's as photorealistic or as engaging or has such cultural value as both mm -hmm. these projects do, you really understand the value of con that it can connect the user, the viewer, the audience, whatever they're called at the moment, uh, in ways that you can't really have in in other media. Um, and yeah, there's yeah. nothing like yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm mindful too of the sort of the um, the writings of the earliest Lumiere screenings of people's yeah. reactions there because of the, the sort of sensation. You know, it was there were new that was a new thing. So. I'm interested in when, when you know, where, where there is an initial um, novelty factor with, with the uh, VR experience, but but sort of move, also moving through that into in, into a deeper engagement with as, as creators, um, how we can really push the boundaries and really explore it, it, its potential. And um, yeah. And as a scientist, yeah. I also see this as a digital archive or baseline data, mm. so that we can go back in future years and map the area again and see the changes and. And look at what are the impacts. You see how close the hut is to the water. What is going to happen with climate change and sea level rise? How are these these really special places going to be preserved? So it has appeals to me from that perspective. And there's a lot of theoretical constructs around that as well. Yeah. And, and you know the aura, the ruin, all of the you know Walter well, Benjamin. There's some great <laughs> yeah. resonances with 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 the artifacts that we're we're creating digitally. Um, I think as well, you know, yeah. how these how these but how these how the, you know, they are um, you know, snapshots in time as well. Yeah, so so it's very rich. But but you know we're in that first decade. I feel of like in the in the 1890s. <laughs> was with film perhaps I, 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 well know, I kind of in, yeah. in our experience I do love the way that Greg embedded the storytelling and the experience and we were able to um, get you know some footage from the digital archives of the film archives yes and yeah. so we had this modern experience that allowed you to look back in time and see the meal that they were having in the hut and you, you sort of were time was meaningless it was mm -hmm. like this amazing flow of time it was very cool 
That's wonderful. It's, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it is such rich territory to mine theoretically, yeah. creatively, uh, shaping and changing how we think about our own disciplines. You know, it's absolutely a artist or an artist that just makes you recalibrate your mindset to what's possible. And even as a scientist, it's like, yeah, that's this, what I mean. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> the sky's the limit, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. So we're nearly out of time, but I would like just to quickly nudge that question that I was uh, wanting to, to bring in because you are kind of circling it, but how do you, like coming from such different disciplines, how do you establish a common language? You know, this is something that we're really interested in around those of us who are interested in art and science collaborations is how do you get to that point where you can talk to each other <laughs> about what you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> kind of beyond the other question it's kind of like you know you kind of have to have a common language to start to work together it's a shared vision shared goals shared yeah. vision you know it, it, it's project based and at a really basic level this is we, we have a yeah something that we want to produce we want to create together um it's, it's passion driven yeah. yeah yeah so the language the language is always that first and foremost it's yeah. it's a, it's a co-popper it's a, and it's, it's an issue it's something that and then everything else seems to fall in line. Like, you it know, Barbara and I, it was like, wow, you're doing that and I'm doing this and <laughs> we could do this and we could do that. And have we thought about, you know, and, and for the right reasons, you know, well, for the reasons that we were passionate about. Um, and everything just kind of, I don't know how to describe it, just kind of happens when you're, when you're both passionate about something. Exactly. Mm. And, and you're dealing too with precious content yeah. You know, I, I think this is, you know, and you are, you are, yeah, you're sort of guardians of that and you're wanting to, you know, to, to you know, t take that out, to communicate it out, you know, so I think I think that's part of it as well. And I think it's a natural, natural curiosity, you know, yeah. artists and scientists are naturally mm -hmm. curious, we're naturally experimental, exactly. um, yeah. and so we are good at going, why? Yeah. What? What is that? Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> We actually do ask the same question. Yeah. Yeah. How <laughs> might we? <laughs> how? How can we do this? How can we do it? You know, it's a so simple, isn't it, really? It is. It's our inquiring minds, right? Mm -hmm. It is. No, I remember, um, I think it was the Ria Roger Horrocks, the, you know, the film writer theorist, um, and uh, he, he talked about experimental film and it's being advanced research projects, you know, art, art films, etc. So, I mean, it, it, again, I think that that's true around yeah. science and art process and, and inquiry have, have, have those, those similar, yeah, those, those similar aspects. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I think we were going to wrap that up.